Uh, good morning, everyone, um, and welcome to uh, another day at Cybos and the final day uh, of the InnoTribe program. I'm your day host. Uh, my name is Uday Goyal. I'm uh, a, an investor in financial technology, financial services, have been for many years. Uh, and I've also had the great pleasure of being involved with InnoTribe pretty much since its inception. So proud to be associated with InnoTribe and back again uh, for another year. So uh, I think today we have a pretty interesting program uh, which uh, focuses quite a bit around the, 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 the twin themes of privacy, identity, data security, some of these issues. And you'll be hearing from a, a number of different speakers across the day uh, of something that's actually becoming pretty core to the way financial services is going to evolve over the next uh, few years. Uh, and this is particularly important as you think about KYC, as you think about security of data, as you think about how you actually identify people coming in and out in a, in a very digital world. And I think our first panel, um, and actually our first uh, two speakers, are actually probably some of the greatest experts um, across the world um, in this space. Um, so um, the, the, our two speakers are Eric Sachs. Eric actually very recently left Google, where he was leading the identity side of Google. Uh, has just joined Microsoft, where he leads the identity side in Microsoft. Um, the big shift for him has been moving uh, uh, away from consumer login, and which he'll talk a little bit about, more towards enterprise scale solutions for, for customers. So basically people uh, in this room and in this conference. Um, and he'll be accompanied, and, and I had the great pleasure of spending quite a bit of time with Eric yesterday. He spoke on some other panels which I was involved with. Um, and I think you'll be hearing some very interesting thoughts uh, around this space from him. And he'll be joined by Don Thibault. And Don is actually an executive director of the OpenID Foundation. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the OpenID Foundation is at the forefront of creating unified identity solutions uh, with single standards uh, uh, across the world. And so I think between the two of them, you're going to get a pretty good feel for where we are in the identity space today. So with that, uh, I'll ask the gentleman to join us on stage. Hi, folks. So I'm Eric Sachs, and this is Don. I'm Don Thibault with the OpenID Foundation. Great. So you heard a little bit of background about us. And while Don and I are going to be up here speaking to you for the next 40 minutes, uh, we're actually hoping to start a dialogue uh, with you all and your expertise in the payment space. So if you look at just a quick comparison of the consumer payment space on the left here and the consumer login space, uh, one of the things that you'll notice is, okay, well, in the payment space, hopefully those of you in it are relatively proud of the amount of choice that you're providing users, different ways to pay, different banks, different credit card companies, et cetera. Been a lot of improvements in security and usability. And many of you all are probably here discussing different standards and trust frameworks that you build that on top of. Now, the consumer login space, this is more where Don and I have spent our time. Can't say that we've achieved quite the level of success. And if anything, we would be jealous of the payment space. So there are still very few choices for users if they're logging in to most consumer sites. It's generally passwords, maybe a few other options. Uh, the security of that continues to be low. The usability of it, if anything, is getting worse. And while Don and I are going to talk about some of the standards, the adoption of those has been, unfortunately, pretty limited. So uh, as I said, Don is going to represent more of the standards organization, and we're actually going to walk through a couple of them. Um, myself, it's, you know, I talked, or gotten a quick intro. I led identity at Google for about 15 years, uh, mostly doing the consumer login space, but a mix of the enterprise space. And so we're going to bounce a little bit between both, the consumer and enterprise, for comparison purposes. Eric will be doing the heavy lifting on most of the presentation. So uh, my role is to do an interpretive dance so that we can really <laughs> make our points known. Great. Uh, OK, so this is the question we actually want to leave you all with at the end. Uh, and we'll start out because it really is, Don and I are talking here, but we want to figure out what can the consumer login space learn from the consumer payment space. There are a lot of parallels between the two, 
uh, and we're actually going to walk through a number of those. We're going to hopefully try to make it entertaining for you all. Hopefully you all had some late nights out last night, and you got your comfy seats, so I'm going to try to keep you awake. But we're going to walk through the evolution in parallel of the consumer payment space and the consumer login space. And we're actually going to show you a number of areas where the consumer login space has already tried to take some insights from the consumer payment space. And our hope is that you all, through the own battles that you've been through in the payment space, may be able to identify other insights that you could suggest to Don and I uh, after today, maybe in the coming weeks, months, we'll let you know how to reach out to us. Uh, but we also hope that uh, you don't have to commit the sins that we did early throughout this uh, journey. Uh, unfortunately. Uh, so we'll come back to that at the end. But as I said, we want to start with comparing the evolution between the payment space and the password space. And to start with that, let's just go back to one of the earlier forms of consumer payments, bartering. Right? This is a very basic uh, mechanism, and I want to do some comparison to If you think about bartering, there are only two parties in the transaction, right? You know, two people exchanging money, and there are no standards involved. You know, sorry, Don, no standards organizations were making money back then. Similarly, if you look at you know, old-style usernames and passwords, you know, when it first came out, there were also just two parties involved, uh, the server that was trying to authenticate the user. And while there were some common UX paradigms, there were no technical standards you know, actually underpinning this. And bartering, uh, it still exists today, you know, not as common. We've most replaced it with other options. But it's been around you know, for thousands and thousands of years. Uh, the username and password, sadly, is still a common technique. And I'm really hoping we're not stuck with it thousands and thousands of years from now. That would be bad. Think of passwords as the cockroaches of the identity ecosystem. Yes. So that was sort of the, the first step in the consumer payment space as well as the consumer login space. Uh, the next step, if you look in the consumer payment space, roughly speaking, was the introduction of uh, money and then eventually, you know, even cash formats. Uh, I don't know about the rest of you all. I still have some cash in my wallet, but we'll talk later about other schemes in the consumer payment space. But again, to keep the comparison between the two going, once you introduce cash, you added two different things. Uh, the first is you introduced a standard, in this case, actually the money involved, you know, whether it's dollars, nickels, or other older forms of cash. So first, that's standard. The second thing is that you introduced an additional party to the equation. It wasn't just the two people bartering, but now you had the government actually issuing the money involved. Now, over at the right here, when you look at your know, login systems, they started to evolve a little bit more, you know, still ugly green screens, but one of the things we saw here was the field up at the top, that username field, increasingly started getting replaced with the field that asked for email address. And here we actually did see the first use of quote unquote standards in the consumer login space. Uh, but it's something that we call the SMTP hack. Uh, the SMTP, for those of you all aren't familiar with it, that is the standard for sending email from one server to another. And I expect that most of you at some point in your life have gone to a consumer login site where you were asked to register by providing your email address, and a message was sent to your email. You had to click a link to verify it. And if you ever in the future forgot your password, you would repeat the process. Enter your email, message was sent via SMTP, you would click on the link. So great, a standard is starting to be used to, to help things. But it wasn't a standard that was actually designed for the purposes of consumer login. SMTP was designed to send email, whereas in the cash space, money, yes, was designed you know, primarily for that purpose. So it, it was a hack, and it still is a hack that was used out there. Uh, but the motivations of it are interesting. The history of it's interesting. Uh, we really only saw usernames starting to be replaced by email in the late 90s when some of the free email services from Yahoo, Hotmail, et cetera, started to become available. And I would love to track down the first person who thought of the idea of changing their login system to use email addresses instead of usernames. But uh, the motivation for doing it was that there, are, there were large help desk costs for running consumer login flows that look like the one shown on the screen here. Uh, users, I expect many of you yourselves, would forget usernames at websites, they would forget passwords, and they would have to call help desk to actually try to recover them. So that was just a high cost. And then some people had this you know, idea, and it looked like different companies around the same time, of switching to email addresses. 
because then users could help themselves if they forgot how to log in. They could reset their own passwords. So it's very economically motivated, just drive down help desk costs. So again, you know, evolution between the two, but some interesting parallels. And let me keep going on that theme, and we'll start talking about some more challenges. Another basic analogy you can make is with safes. You know, once people start having more cash, more coins they had to protect, you started seeing people who had safes actually in their homes or in their offices. Uh, and in the consumer login space, this is a screenshot from one of the early uh, Netscape Navigator browsers in the late 90s. You started seeing what were called password safes or password managers back there. Uh, where users were taking their own responsibility to store their own passwords just as they might take responsibility for storing their own safes. Now, I got to assume in this audience, most of you are not storing all of your money in a safe in your house. We will discuss some other options. But unfortunately, in the password area, I expect many of you probably do use password managers and are taking all the responsibility to protect your own passwords. Unfortunately, that is about where we've evolved. So let me go one step further, and that's the introduction of uh, banks, as well as another form of consumer payment, uh, which is that of checks, right? Checks introduced another standard uh, for payment introductions on top of uh, the earlier cash forms. Uh, and banks introduced a more potentially secure form of protecting your money than a safe in your house. But there was another complication that was added once we brought in banks. And that's the question of trust. And we're going to talk about this trust world a whole bunch of different times. And Don will help me with that. Because when banks first came out, there was a question for consumers of, OK, what bank should I trust to protect my money? I have to worry about, are they going to protect my money from bad actors? Is there going to be an evil employee at the bank who's going to steal my money? So that was one trust dimension. And then once checks started to come out, you know, merchants had to decide from which banks they might accept a check. Banks had to decide what uh, other banks to accept checks from. And one of the ways, if you look you know, back in this time period, how did we increase the trust level to uh, increase the adoption of banks? Well, you know, we saw big things was regulation and trust frameworks. Uh, you saw the introduction, for example, in the 1930s of federal deposit insurance mechanisms in the US and later other countries to help users get more confidence with having their money in the banks. And then different regulatory frameworks and trust frameworks were established to get the banks to trust each other. And you know, those different layers in the cake have been extremely powerful. Unfortunately, let's look over at the consumer login space and try to figure out, OK, what is the comparative you know, there to banks? You know, banks' job is to be a safe for your money. In the login space, we talk about identity safes or identity providers as being the comparable form. The most common version of that you've probably seen is uh, buttons like these, these you know, login with Facebook, login with Google buttons. Or if you go to a website and you click one of those, you're saying, oh, instead of me directly giving you a password, I've chosen to have this other company assert my identity to you, you know, Facebook, Google, someone else. And while there has been some adoption of that, we're going to go through a lot of the problems. One of the biggest uh, set of problems, though, missing in this area is there is no regulation. There are no trust frameworks. So there are a lot of questions about, you know, should consumers trust this mechanism? Should uh, websites and e-commerce sites trust these approaches? What identity providers should be trusted? There's a whole range of trust questions there. And while in the payment space, we've started to address that through regulatory frameworks and trust frameworks, uh, we're going to talk about our attempts to do that in the consumer login space that have unfortunately had some level of success, but not as much as we'd like. And we're going to try to make that even more interesting uh, for you all who haven't had enough coffee from the great baristas back there. Uh, Don and I are going to walk through a bunch of different battles that we've had over especially the last 13 years to try to actually get rid of passwords. And in each space, we're going to compare two primary options that were used. And then Don's going to help me decide who's been the winner in each of these different rounds, these battles that have occurred. So let me hit the first round in that battle. And I'm going to take a relatively simple one, but it provides a construct on which we can build. And so the first round was uh, employers trying to get rid of passwords for their own employees. Uh, it's pretty common these days for an organization to decide that, oh, I want to outsource my email services to some other uh, s software as a service provider like Google or Microsoft, or maybe outsource my customer relationship to Salesforce or 
other SaaS providers of that ilk. And while they could have had their employees go to those sites, manage their own passwords in sort of a shadow IT form, uh, it's not something the security departments of employers like. They'd much prefer the use of single sign-on technology. You heard terms like federation, uh, SAML as a technology standard. But the trust model here, to talk about that, is very simple. Because the organization is paying the third party to provide a service to their employees, so they can tell them Okay, for my employees, you will use this one corporate identifier. Similarly, the employer can tell their employees, you must use this one identifier to identify yourself to these different third-party applications. And the end result has actually worked pretty well. The adoption of single sign-on in enterprises has been fantastic, great balance of usability and security. And in fact, one of the interesting things we find in the consumer space is a lot of people are both employees and consumers, right? Two halves of our lives. And we say that a lot of the demand in the consumer login space to get rid of passwords comes from people who've sort of gotten this experience in the employee in the workforce use case and wonder, why the heck can I have that in my personal life? But we'll talk about consumers in a minute. At least in the employee case, employer case, trying to get rid of passwords. Don, who would you say had won this round? Well, clearly the employers have. All of you are, or many of you are, both employees and consumers. And so with the exception of Facebook and Google, um, we see the employee and enterprise space really taking off um, in this user experience. Of course, they're not burdened by the, some of the privacy models. Yeah, uh, and in particularly the convenience thing, which is a dimension we're going to talk about a few times, the convenience for users, and in this case, employees, is very nice. I introduced myself earlier as uh, one of the leaders of the OpenID Foundation. And again, that is a team of rivals that came together to try and build in federation standards. Companies like PayPal began to join the OpenID Foundation because they began to see the security model in new and different ways. Yep. Now let me move on to round two, where we're going to talk about two geek terms, OpenID and SMTP. Don was just talking about standards federation. Well, uh, I've been working in the Bay Area for a long time. That is an area where you have a bunch of engineers who assume engineering can solve all problems. Uh, things like standards organizations, trust framework, are not the default approach there. So what you saw is some of the first attempts in at least those set of companies in the Bay Area to replace passwords was said, oh, well, we just need a technology to replace this. And we created something called the OpenID technology format, and later Don will talk more about the foundation. And one of the goals here was to create something similar to what was used in corporations, slightly different uh, standard. You'll hear SAML and employee use cases and OpenID in consumer use cases, but for the most part, similar functionality. So within that engineering community, we said, oh, well, we need to get rid of this SMTP hack, because that wasn't really ever designed for login systems, and we're going to do something better. We got this protocol, OpenID, and the theory was at that time that we would get consumers to go to websites, type in their email address, like say a Gmail address, and the website would be able to look up and say, oh, you know, Google operates an identity provider for all their email users. Let me redirect the user there instead of sending them to this hacky technique of sending a message to their email address. Uh, but Don, how would you say in this round an attempt for a pure technology solution worked? I'd like to say that OpenID Connect is prevailing, but the SMT hack is still the best case scenario. And a lot of it, unfortunately, comes back to convenience. And we'll talk about a couple more reasons why. But let me move on to the, same, the third round, because we weren't done. Uh, but that engineering community started waking up to the fact that, OK, maybe just a bunch of software is not going to be sufficient to solve this problem, get rid of passwords. And this is where we started to realize that, OK, maybe we need to join forces. And this is where Don talked about the Open Identity Foundation. Uh, just background, I was at Google leading the identity team around 2006. We hadn't yet you know, come and join with Don and the foundation. What motivated Google was we were starting to see um, password reuse. Now, this is a, uh, a problem that's talked about a lot in the press the last decade. Uh, but actually, back in 2006, we hadn't, it hadn't even occurred to us. Uh, this was when we started to realize, oh my god, a lot of Gmail users, they would use exactly their same Gmail address and password to log into Google as they would to other websites. And we started to realize that the hackers weren't breaking through our super strong security at Google. They were just breaking into any website where users would reuse passwords. 
get their passwords there, and then come and use it to log into Google. Once they got into Google, a whole bunch of things would happen. Uh, it would certainly cause customer support costs to rise because we'd have to help users recover their accounts, but also the hackers would perform bad actions in Google properties, like go to YouTube and you know, put in weird spam you know, with links to their Viagra they're trying to sell, et cetera. So Google had a strong financial incentive to try to stop this form of password reuse. And fortunately, the OpenID Foundation group actually caused a bunch of us to realize that this wasn't unique to Google. Folks at Yahoo realized they had the same problem, at AOL, the same problem, at Hotmail, the same problem. So this is where Don and the foundation were able to get a bunch of backstabbing competitors together who all had an aligned incentive with economic motivation. We all agreed on the same standard. We all had the same goal. And so we thought with our hubris that this was going to be sufficient. So Don, how would you say this round has played out? Uh, round goes to hackers, Eric. <laughs> Uh, let me give you an experience, um, a scientific survey of the people that live in my household around passwords. And they said, Dad, we've got this figured out. We use the same password in each of our logins. And I said, ouch. And Eric, what was the name of that password? Password123. There you All go. Right. <laughs> OK, so round four then. Uh, here we actually started to realize, OK, Technology by itself not sufficient. The organization by itself not sufficient. Another large challenge we realized was that user experience was critical here. Because you see screens, you know, like this one left, you've been trained to see these for over a decade. You would expect that a login flow would ask for your password. So how the heck were we going to get rid of passwords if the very first thing people saw was that password field? So we actually spent a number of years as an industry experimenting with different UX techniques to try to figure out how do we get rid of that password but deal with user, some users who have them, some users who don't at websites. And one of the techniques that has become more and more popular is one you can see, for example, on Microsoft's login screen you have here. If you look at Google's, it's similar, a lot of others, where you notice the first screen doesn't ask for the password. And I expect many of you have logged into Microsoft and Google the last few years, and you may not have even picked up that the login flow changed to look like this, that we hid the password field. We didn't have to go back and train users. Instead, it just asks a simple question to users. What type of identifier are you trying to use to access, in this case, services at Microsoft? Uh, and after the user has typed their identifier, like an email address or a phone number, then the service provider, in this case Microsoft, can do some smart lookups on its side and decide a couple things. Maybe it's a user typing an email address who's never used Microsoft before. Great. Well, start a sign-up flow for them. Uh, maybe the email address being typed is that of an employee's email address for a company who has outsourced their email to Microsoft. Well, great. Redirect them to their corporate identity provider. They're probably already logged in, and they get that nice single sign-on experience. But the other theory that we've had, and we've had some experimentation with, is uh, imagine a user goes here and they type an address ending with at gmail.com, you know, a Google address. Microsoft can look at that and say, OK, you know, Microsoft and Google, we actually talk with each other a lot, on the identity side at least. <laughs> uh, Microsoft could look at that email address and say, well, let me redirect the user to Google's identity provider. I know this OpenID technology. We're in this foundation together. We've got this user experience that works pretty well. And while they could do that, and they have experimented with that, Don, how would you say this battle has worked out? We're making some progress. Identifier first is increasingly becoming adopted because it allows this sweet spot between consumer behavior and enterprise behavior to be re fully realized. Yep. Unfortunately, the next round was a surprise to us. So the next round was social networks who came out of uh, nowhere. So most of the first few rounds that we talked about, uh, this battle was going on before social networks had really become popular. This was more like the 2000s to around maybe 2006, 2008. But by around 2008, social networks had really taken off in popularity. Uh, a lot of people, again, especially with the hubris of the Bay Area tech field, you know, social will take off everything. Uh, we hadn't had the backlash yet by the press and by politicians. And we started to see not just login providers run by email providers, but we saw login identity providers run by social networks. You saw login with MySpace buttons, login with Google Plus buttons, login with Facebook buttons, et cetera. Now, there's an interesting trust and security dynamic here that's not immediately obvious. Uh, 
Imagine, for example, Yahoo tells a website via one of these technologies that, okay, the user on the computer owns Frank underscore Smith at yahoo.com. Well, it's pretty reasonable to trust Yahoo to say someone owns a Yahoo email address. But what if, say, MySpace asserted to a consumer website that they're pretty sure the person on this computer owns Frank underscore Smith at yahoo.com? Should the tri site trust that? Yes or no? Well, uh, did some analysis of the industry, and what we concluded is pretty much all the websites that added these social network provider buttons would trust any of them to assert any email address. But when we looked at the security of this, what we realized is a lot of people's passwords on social networking sites were much worse than their passwords at email providers. And some of the email providers had started adding additional layers of security, like two-step verification. Uh, and unfortunately, it wasn't just us who picked this up. It was the hackers, too. The hackers now realized, oh, wait. I don't need to break into the user's Google account and their identifier to there. Let me break into the user's social network account that they created, or maybe create one on behalf of them with their email address, and then go to almost any website who has one of these social login buttons, uh, click it, and break into the user's account. Now, I'm supposed to be one of these very knowledgeable people in the identity space. And I had exactly this problem happen to me. I had signed up for one unnamed blue social network uh, that I wanted to experiment with, with a low quality password. I didn't really use social networks much. And some hackers did, in fact, break into that account at that social network, went to a bunch of other websites where I had accounts, clicked that login button, broke into my accounts there. So I should have known better, but even I couldn't protect myself. So unfortunately, Don, who won this round? I'd love to say that security trumped convenience. But of course, we all know that the winner here is the social login providers. The user, the customer, the citizen, again and again, will prefer convenience over the most rational argument for a secure alternative. Yep. So definitely, that convenience factor is a really hard one to fight against. So let me move into round six, because it is an industry we weren't willing to give up. You know, again, we had our technical underpinnings of OpenID as a technology. We added in the OpenID Foundation for a group of organizations to try to get together. But once this problem happened with social networks, one of the interesting things is that we all love to beat up on social networks, but there were plenty of people at social networks running these identifiers who realized what was happening and felt quite bad about it. They tried to, in their documentation and best practices, to educate you know, websites, please, there's more to the security model here than just sticking a social network icon on your website. But they weren't that successful. So some of the social networks did get together with some of the identity providers, and we actually challenged each other. We're like, oh my god, you know, how are we going to keep security from getting worse here? Because it certainly you know, felt to us like it was. And one of the things we spent a lot of time doing was actually looking at the consumer payments space, trying to say, OK, you know, were there models from there that we could bring to try to help us with the security issue? And in particular, we looked at the model of banks and checking forms of payment, because again, we compared banks frequently to identity providers. And we said to ourselves, we're like, all right, there are standards in that area and there are foundations, but there are also trust frameworks, both at a regulatory level and just you know, among companies themselves. And so this is where we said, all right, maybe we need to introduce those types of models into the consumer login space. And that led to the OIX. John, Don, could you talk to us a little more yeah, about so the OIX? Yeah, so as Eric said, we discovered that technology tools were not sufficient. We had a superior solution embedded in an open standard like OpenID Connect, but it wasn't enough to move the market. What we arrived at is what many of you know instinctively and what we've seen in the credit card industry, that it's only when we align technology tools in open standards like OpenID Connect with governance rules, compliance with legal contractual requirements and regulatory requirements that we realize that the sum of those two parts, tech tools, governance rules, created trust. So the trust frameworks that Eric's been talking about has really been at the center of the work that we've been doing with the Open Identity Exchange over the last nine years. We were surprised that governments began to join the Open Identity Exchange the US government, here in the UK, and other governments, because they knew that they had to have a dialogue with the technology community so, again, we could align 
conformance to technology standards with compliance to legal rules and government requirements. It's only when you get those two right that we can begin to really provide the trust, security, and ease of use that consumers, customers, and citizens demand. So this alignment of tech tools and rules, of course, is at the heart of the credit card industry and the value that it creates. Yep. Uh, and I'm sure you all will be absolutely stunned by this, but the involvement of governments and regulators created some requirements that were not successful. Uh, never happens, right? Certainly not in the consumer payment space. So uh, we've had some success here, uh, but a lot of failures as well. So Don, unfortunately, who's won this round? Oh, Eric, you know the answer to this question better than I do. <laughs> yeah, the winner is social login. Yep. And again, back to that convenience factor. Uh, so let me talk about two more rounds that happened. And uh, actually, you know, I noticed Don and I were a little tight on time, so we'll make it go a little bit faster. Uh, the next challenge that hit us was the adoption of mobile apps. Uh, again, you know, this battle and this war started back in 2003. You didn't have iPhones and Android phones back then. Uh, but by around the time of 2010, 2012, you saw iPhones and Androids taking off. Mobile apps were going to replace everything, just like social networks was going to replace everything. And while we had built all this great technology for federation and identifiers, it actually did not work with mobile devices at all. And in fact, for years, there was a lot of tension between, on one side, iOS and Android, and on the other side, the community, security community, identity community, trying to figure out, OK, what is a reasonable balance of usability and security for mobile applications? In fact, most of the battles were about the fact that uh, login flows tend to need to happen in web browsers where you can have more dynamic forms of security to protect against hackers that needs to constantly evolve and not wait for the next app store review process. Whereas both uh, Android and Apple wanted everything to happen within their apps. And it took a while for them to experiment with us as a community and eventually accept that, OK, they were going to need to allow these types of login flows to happen within browsers. And really, actually, only in about the last year or so uh, have we seen a you know, a different answer to this battle. So Don, who would you say has ended up winning this round? I'm glad, glad to say, and the logic permits, that this is industry standards. When we began to optimize for the platform of choice, the smartphone, standards won the day. All right. Now, if we go on to the next round, here's an interesting one. And it's the latest one that we're dealing with, the last battle we'll talk about before returning to consumer payments. And that is ad networks and passwords. And most people would say, what the hell, excuse my French, do passwords and uh, ad networks have to do with each other? Well, unfortunately, these are some examples of some of the press coverage. There is a lot of negative press right now about how ad networks work within browsers to track users across sites. And the general model of a lot of ad networks is they are trying to consistently identify users across different websites in a browser so that they can provide more relevant ads to users. So they use browser techniques like sessions, URLs, iframes, other geeky techniques to consistently identify a user across websites. Well, uh, what do identity providers do? Identity providers use browsers and techniques like sessions and cookies to try to consistently identify a user across websites. And what we're now seeing is that a lot of the uh, public pushback around ad networks is causing browsers to actually uh, start breaking features that have been used for years within the security community to support identity providers in those techniques. And actually, in many cases, we're now, especially in the last six to nine months, we're actually having to replace the security of identity providers and go back to passwords because the browsers are starting to break features that we relied upon. Again, their goal wasn't to hurt security. It wasn't to hurt identity providers. It's just that the, the PR press is so intense right now on Ads Network that a side effect is that security is being significantly reduced and could be reduced much further. So Don, this is a weird one. Was convenience the winner here? It's a rare case where convenience is not winning out. It's a battle that is too early to tell. And all of you are participants. As you click your way through consent screen after consent screen, you see this dynamic taking place, where convenience now has been trumped by the uh, hand of regulators and the sensitivity around privacy. Yep. Well, great. Well, let me return now to the 
original analysis we were doing, comparing the evolution of consumer payments and the consumer login system. Because given all these you know, battles that we've talked about, that we've gone through to try to make identity providers successful, where it hasn't been sufficient, uh, we're again now looking back to the consumer payments to space, say, OK, you all as an industry, you could continue to evolve. What new insights you know, could we take from your world uh, into our world? And one of the big comparisons that we're looking at right now uh, is not about banks, but about credit cards, credit card networks. In the identity community, there are a couple interesting you know, things for us about them. The first is the security model that credit card companies have a strong economic incentive to protect against fraud. That's one interesting aspect. Another interesting aspect is the choice it provides. You have you know, a range of different credit card networks around the world, different companies issuing credit cards, et cetera. So there's a great, you know, great security, great user choice. We'd love to bring that to consumer login space. But the other interesting dynamic we look at is roughly the model we see in the consumer login space is credit card companies sit between users in their, and their banks, somewhat of an oversimplification. But in the consumer login space, what we've wondered is, do we need to establish something similar? Do we need to have something sitting between users and their identity providers that might help us eliminate passwords? And we start using the term identity and custodian in the community to talk about what form this might take. Uh, the most basic example that exists today that sits between users and identity providers are actually password managers. We talked about them earlier. I expect many of you all you know, take advantage of them. What we're starting to see, though, is password managers evolving a little bit. Uh, password manager by different definition, right? It's managing passwords. But what if it didn't have to? What we're seeing is some of those products are evolving to be more general account managers. Imagine you go to a website and you do choose to use the login with Google button or some other identity provider. The software on your computer that traditionally remembers an email address and password can instead remember your email address and the identity provider that you chose to use. And if you return to that site in the future, instead of having to navigate through the UI and tell them that, oh, you'd rather log in with an identity provider than a password and actually provide all that information, uh, we can provide interfaces for applications and websites to collect that immediately from the user's quote unquote identity custodian. Uh, and we've actually, in the last year, we've done a lot of experiments with this. There are some very uh, successful case studies so far. But it is still in an earlier stage. And it's just an example of why Don and I and others from the identity community are here this week. We're still looking for what are additional insights from the consumer payment space that might help us to actually make this successful. Uh, I'm going to skip this just for purposes of time. You know, an obvious one to then look at is the evolution of credit cards into mobile payments, especially uh, NFC. Now, in the identity space, when we started playing around with mobile, we managed to improve security a little bit, uh, but we drastically hurt usability. In the mobile payment space, you managed to improve both, improve usability and security. But you see screens like the ones I uh, hear over my shoulder, where I expect many of you encounter these maybe even more than once a day, where you receive an OTP message sent to your phone, you have to go type it in to get into websites. It's just more and more friction added for the user. And while, yes, it is a best practice to do this, and yes, it adds some security, if you follow the press on those techniques, unfortunately, the security part has dropped down a lot. Uh, hackers have found attacks. You hear texts like um, SIM swap attacks used against Twitter's CEO recently. Uh, hackers have gotten sophisticated enough to fish not just users for passwords, but also for OTPs and mobile approvals. If you read the press this week about YouTube, YouTube just had a large series of high profile YouTube channels hijacked in this form. So the security part is dropping a little bit, the benefit, but all the usability pain is still there. Uh, another challenge, especially in the consumer space, is account recovery. If any of you have ever changed your phone number after signing up for services like two-step verification, you'll find it's very hard to get back into your account if you change your phone number because you can't prove control over it. So another problem we have. And so we'd love to find a way to bring sort of that NFC form of usability into the consumer login space. And we're in the very early stages here of um, some technologies to actually try to bring that in. So you may see devices like these on the right. Uh, you will hear them called security keys. You may hear the term FIDO. It's another standard. But roughly speaking, it's trying to bring smart cards, which I expect many of you all are familiar with. It's trying to bring the technology of smart cards into the consumer login space using 
as much as possible NFC or consumer technologies like Bluetooth with the better usability aspects of that. Again, to see where we might evolve the consumer payment space. So we're running out of time at the end here. I just wanted to come back and you know, talk about, you know, again, why Don and I are here, why we are sort of jealous that as the consumer space, you've managed to pull out this amazing dynamic range of choice for users and great security. And Don and I are mostly responsible for login screens like this one at Reddit. It looks like the same thing you might have seen in 1995. It's just a username and password. And sorry to beat up, beat up on Reddit if they're here. There are plenty of other sites like this. So we just wanted to leave you again with that, sorry for time purposes, that question we asked you, which is we've explained some of the challenges we've had. We've talked with you about how we've taken some insights from the payment space and tried to bring it to consumer login space. And we're hoping that you all will get in touch with Don and I after today, coming hours, weeks, months, and let us know if you think there are other insights from your own experiences that we could apply in the space and try to improve the security and usability of passwords. So thank you for your time. And Don, if you want to finish Eric, up for us. As Eric and I indicated, we're the world of open banking and open identity are beginning to collide. So we want to bring this dialogue up so that as you begin to develop the new generation of PSD2 and other standards, we can learn from the lessons in the identity community. Give us uh, a, contact us at the OpenID Foundation. We'd be happy to continue this conversation. All right. Thank you all for your thank time you. today. We appreciate it. So, so I, I found obviously I found all of that super fascinating. But let me let me <laughs> throw you throw out probably something that people are thinking about in their minds right now, which you haven't mentioned once throughout this entire discussion. Yeah. Biometrics. Yes. So why? Why they're using? Why they're not? Why, why why isn't that part of this discussion? Yep. Why is there a country that's 1.3 billion people that has solved an identity problem that with the use haven't. of bio, biometrics? and the rest of the world isn't doing the same. Yep. Well, I expect many of you have uh, iPhones or even Android phones, and you've got your great fingerprint reader on that. That is great. But as many of you know, within uh, at least the US and Europe, uh, there's pretty standard established practice to never take that biometric information off the phone. So once you've got your phone set up, biometrics are great. But if you break your phone, and you need to set up your new an Android phone or iPhone, the way you set it up is you type your email address, your password, and maybe you get an OTP sent to you there. There's no biometrics involved. Unfortunately, you know, other uh, countries have been more open to experimenting with actually biometrics stored in the cloud. But at least within you know, US and Europe, that's right now a bit of a no-no. Uh, but we may have to go back and experiment more with that in the consumer login well, space. It feels to me, I mean, l last night at one of the dinners that one of you attended, one of the, some of the dinners, I had a pretty interesting dinner where I had, for example, the Bank of England sitting there, the mayor, sitting there, a few other people, and we had a pretty robust discussion. And one of the things that we were, we were just debating Libra, yep. which obviously is a big topic right now um, around. And we said, look, let's think of about, about a utopic world mm. where Libra becomes ubiquitous, right? And we use Libra for all our transactions. Um, and there's a single wallet that each person stores their Libra in, which yep. then they use, and they identify their, their way into that wallet. So how, how do you, I mean, I just want to throw that out to you. Well, how do you think about a world and how realistic is a world where we, we finally find a utopic way to get to a single identifier? It, it, I think it may be possible. At the end of the day, the identifier is still representing us. We're always you know, still one person. Uh, but as we were talking about today, this is probably not something taught by technology, technology alone. There are probably multiple layers here. Uh, similarly, you know, the consumer websites like Google, like Facebook, they've come to accept that no, they can't solve all problems by themselves. They need partners. And one of the critical partners may be actually banks, credit card companies, you know, governments. It may be that no, no one will ever trust Google or Facebook to store biometrics in the cloud. But maybe they will or already have decided to trust their bank, their government with that information. And maybe the next time you break your iPhone and replace your iPhone, maybe the way that you will get your account back onto it is in partnership with biometrics, with your bank or your government or your credit card company. And the Google and Facebook only get involved after you set up that device and are leveraging the local biometrics. So we may need partnerships that just don't exist today. So it's one, of, one of the interesting Sorry. things about Libra was, in that announcement, was a governance body that would be based in Switzerland that would somehow provide the quasi-regulatory environment for the Libra ecosystem. So that'll be an interesting space to watch. So, so if you think about it, it strikes me 
also that I looked at this entire thing and the approach and what, what you're saying is let's go look at where the fintech environment, the banks have done it because clearly they have a lot more to lose if identity goes wrong, absolutely, because there's money involved. But if you, and you saw Brett, Brett King will be speaking later yep. today, he did a speech yesterday oh, at the Global did. Leaders event, you saw the, the speech he made. And one of the things he said was, you know, one of the biggest problems we have is we seem to design around legacy, if, nice. I'm, if I'm calling it correctly, right? We don't really go back to first principles design and really think through the problem. And, it's, and one of the things he threw up there was the smile to pay yes. paradigm. Yes, smile to pay, which has become quite big in China. So in China, the way you authenticate yourself for a payment is you walk in, there's a QR code, and some places have basically a camera, and they use the, the biometric yep. authentication of the face. So I, I guess one of the things that I noticed is what you're looking, what, what I see here is very much evolutionary increment, yes. incremental evolutionary addition. Why aren't we just redesigning it from scratch and trying to yep. go there? Well, and we talked before about a lot of the focus right now is around the user experience. And actually, it's funny enough, that term, that you know, go back to first principles, we don't tend to bring technology geeks or security geeks into the room when you're doing UX design. You bring in UX designers who know nothing about security, and they know what problems they're trying to solve for themselves. They were the ones who came up with Identifier first design. It didn't come from anyone in the security identity community. And we are starting to see that. Unfortunately, and again, I think this is what a lot of the banks run into, yeah, the legacy problem does exist there. You know, Microsoft and Google, we have billions of users who are already logging into our sites. You know, the booking.com was there last night. You know, they have the same problem. How do you move your existing user base over is a challenge, whereas there is a huge advantage for people just to leapfrog that and say, you know what, I never started with that legacy base. Let me start fresh, as you know, many countries outside the United States have been able to do. I'm envious. <laughs> So is there a way, I mean, I, I get, I mean, obviously the legacy problem is the same problem that banks and insurance companies face here, which is you have an entire legacy uh, technology stack and moving into a more efficient new technology stack requires a migration nope. and migrations are inherently risky they because are. that's why people hate them. So, do, but as I said to you before, India, which is a country of 1.3 billion people, did a massive migration yep. over the course of a year where everybody had to go in and sign up in a government-approved biometric center, fingerprints, facial scans, yep. uh, retinal scans all at once, and that, that becomes your identifier in the cloud irrefutable. Yeah, so, but, but unfortunately not for, say, if you use Facebook, if you use YouTube, if you use Google, as yet, even there, they're back, right? We have not found that partnership between you know, consumer pipes and other players in that So that, that leads me to my next question, which is, is the solution something that requires government intervention versus what I heard here, which is, I didn't hear government much apart from the point where you said, well, when the government got involved, it screwed up completely. Yes, of course it did. What a surprise, right? And the expectation is there probably needs to be a balance of all at the end of the day, right? You know, we've, hey, let's, you know, uh, we talked about the SMTP hack, the internet, DNS. Well, at the end of the day, you still have governments underpinning DNS. It's all built on this at some level. You can't avoid it. Uh, but I think we, you know, as the technology community and the government community, we're not great at talking with each other. Uh, but I think there can be opportunities there that we just haven't found yet. Okay, so one of the sorry, challenges done. there is for done. government is a cultural change. Yeah. For government to move from a paradigm where they're at the center of the ecosystem to where they are a player, a stakeholder in a global ecosystem that has to interoperate across the public and private sector and around the globe. But is, I mean, okay, I'm going to be a little bit provocative here, no, right? No. But isn't the big problem here the following? Um, and maybe I'll illustrate it with, I have the new iPhone here. Uh oh, he's going right? to the, the three iPhone. cameras. The iPhone the has the three cameras, and somebody sent me a fantastic, I, I don't know if you've seen this, which said, Homeland Security, CIA, and MI6, right? <laughs> right? Which, so, question mark, isn't the problem that there's this distrust that sits between the consumer, the technology companies, and government, the consumers all think the technology companies are already in bed with the government, right? Because right, they're of backdoor keys and coming in. And therefore, for consumers to, to actually give up the concept of identity authentication to technology companies doesn't work because they think the governments are involved anyway, and they won't give it up to government because then they think the governments are going to spy on them. So how do we get ourselves out of this? Uh, uh, so you, you talk about that problem, I'll be honest, at Google, at Google, at Facebook, Microsoft, 
I, it seems like most people don't read the press. Like, I, I agree with you, but actually what they care about is convenience, oh yeah, and convenience, and oh yeah, convenience. Certainly some people have those concerns, uh, but we haven't found that they're a significant percentage of the users. So we're back to that convenience factor. But unfortunately, when people think about convenience, they don't think about security, they don't think about protecting themselves. Actually, what a lot of them do consider is the government's role, like the government should be looking out for their security, and they get a little bit annoyed that they had to take responsibility for protecting themselves. They're like, isn't that my darn government's job? Why should I have to worry about that? So uh, like an interesting example, when we were talking about working with the, the government in the login space, uh, one of the things they pushed for was some very fancy privacy features and identity providers. Uh, in particular, they said, oh, we shouldn't give users email addresses to any consumer websites. Just make up some identifier, something similar to what Apple is doing in Apple IDs. And this was great until users started calling help desks. Like they would you know, do some things online, but if you went offline and called a help desk, usually you identify yourself with like, your phone number or email address. And if the you know, consumer site doesn't have that information, it's a little hard to connect to online and offline identities. So that's an example where the government sort of took us too far and solved the problem that most people didn't care about, maybe a you know, tiny less than 1%. Yeah. I thought, so so yeah, finding I, that balance. I know you want, John, you wanted to jump in. I, I thought Francois Macron said it very well that we live in this bipolar world of state-sponsored identity in the Chinese model and the wild, wild west of the California model. <laughs> And I think what we have to do and what's happening here in the UK and Europe is finding a third way. And, and, you know, and the other thing that I didn't hear through all this discussion was uh, with, the, with machine learning and artificial intelligence coming in, why isn't it that we can use fuzzy logic and, and algorithms that use multifactorial data and information to say yep. you are Eric because of the following 85 factors and therefore, my confidence interval goes all the way well, right to the end. Don and I skipped over this. Um, sadly, the techniques you've talked about are very successful. Like Google, Facebook, Hotmail, they hardly ever have account hijacking anymore unless it's against very targeted individuals like politicians. Uh, they have used AI and stuff to basically just make it nearly impossible for hackers. But that's a very, very small number of websites who have done that and have enough signals to do it. The vast majority of you know, e-commerce and other sites out there storing user personal information, they don't get enough data to train their intelligence to achieve this type of stuff. That's one of the theories why maybe identifiers would you know, extend that model. Uh, but we, we just haven't figured out a way to make it scale yet. So, so I have one last thing because we're out of time, yep. which is, um, I don't know if you ever watched a series on Netflix called Black Mirror. It's super interesting. <laughs> Don looks is, like he has. Yeah, was, but basically, if you haven't, I urge you to do it. But it's very, it's about dystopia in a major way, technology dystopia in a major way. And one of the most recent ones was a lot about identity. And what do I mean by identity? Because basically, increasingly, our lives are getting stored on social media. Certainly not my generation, thank God, but <laughs> certainly there's, there's the, that, that's happening. But that means actually who you are as a person is stored there. And one of the things that's very key, critical there is that people don't break in, and that's why right. you have that. But then the other question that came up in one of the episodes is what happens when somebody dies right. and their family, family wants, wants to get access, access to it? And the social media companies say, you can't have access to that identity yep. because you don't have the right credentials to come in. Is that something that you've ever kind of thought about? As oh, you yeah, <laughs> we had an informal group about, from each of the social, work, uh, social networks called the Deadheads. They were the people in charge of answering that question. But I think we, um, we're seeing that play out in, a, in real time on TV and in the uh, user experiences that we've described today. Great. Okay, well, thank you very much. It's a, a big round of applause for our speakers. Thank you for giving us your time.